Hey guys, um, we are in the middle of a all day recording session. We've got Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Raw here, so we thought it'd be a great opportunity to open up the floor for a fan Q and A. We got some fans here in the audience, so we're just going to turn the floor over to them and and uh, hit the Matt and Aaron with uh, whatever questions they have. We got one. I got one. Did, did you bring any of your private mental beer? She's drinking one. Oh, oh no, no the, the one with my name on it. Yeah, no. I'm going to. No, I'm still waiting on that next batch. Okay. That I don't I don't know how late it is. Oh, the godless heathen. Yeah. I talked to Lance. And he's notoriously dragging his feet. So. <coughs> is he gonna have that next next batch? We got your label still. If you want your labels back, the, the, the godless heathen brand. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want the beer. I've actually got you know, some other people have been, have been trying it and said they really like it. And so we were all upset when I run out. <laughs> you know, and so I would really like to get another couple of cases of that for AACon. Can they possibly manufacture it fast enough to suit you, though? <laughs> <laughs> no, they can. When Lance shows up, we'll light a fire under his ass. <laughs> he should be here soon. All right. Uh, Aaron, you, you talked earlier about the. Uh, Earth being soon to be starved out or suffocated out. Uh, can you? What is? What are some of the things? That, some of the steps that we need to take now to keep that from happening? What would be the biggest? The top number three? of people that we have on the planet right now mm -hmm. requires that we be extremely efficient with our food production, mm -hmm. and we are so not. Okay, look at the way that we're fishing out everything. China by itself is out fishing the Pacific Ocean by itself. Uh, Twenty some odd years ago, I remember, well, actually probably 30 years ago now, I applied for a job in, uh, in, in Alaska for shipping canneries and everything. They were paying a ridiculous amount of money for people that would endure the, the weather up there. And you'd, you'd be up there for like three or four months, you'd come back with tens of thousands of dollars, and it was a good deal. But they, start, they changed the laws on it because they realized they were having more and more <coughs> fishing boats out every year. <coughs> more and more fishing boats every year, yet they were bringing in collectively fewer fish. So every year they have more fishing boats than they had the year before, but every year those collectively are bringing in fewer fish. Now what's that tell you? That the oceans cannot replenish as fast as we are consuming them. And the sad thing is, since we refuse to be efficient about anything, we're going to present ourselves with a problem because we are going to run out of food. We're going to run out of the ability to produce food, and we are keep we keep mass producing people. We're really good at that, and that's going to present a problem. Anyone else? Come on, Salisa. I know what? You're, you're dying. <laughs> you're, no, no, you're dying. Ass I'm not. Anybody? I'd like to know who either one of you would love to debate but have never had the chance. I don't care about who. I'm not. It's not the person. I'm debating an issue, and half the time I don't want to know that much about who I'm debating for fear that I'll fall into the trap of preparing to debate that person rather than debating the issue at hand. Um, so, I mean, you could probably list. I was looking forward to debating D'Souza, but that fell through. Uh, it'd be nice if William Lane Craig would stop. I don't know being a pretentious jackass, but I understand people he gets to debate who he wants, but I don't have specific people that I want to debate. I just want to do more debates. And I've had a number of people challenging me just in the last month, and I've had to tell them over and over again just exactly what Matt said, that it doesn't matter who the person is. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if he's if he's the, the, the bottom rung or if he's the most intimidating warrior you have. It really doesn't make any difference. What is the, the point is, what are we debating? What's the topic? And if it's a good subject, then we'll run with that. And fortunately, when I've allowed the believer to name their own topic, they come up with much better ideas than I do. And I'm doing a debate on the 30th uh, in Waco. I don't know who my opponent is. It doesn't matter. I, I just know what the subject is. That's true. And it made me think of something. Uh, the 29th Frank Turek will be here in person. Just FYI, if you, I know you'll be in Waco the day be the day after that. So well, I'll probably I'll, I'll be here the 29th. Okay. But yeah, I don't want to be in the same room with Frank. It's Turek a different right address, there. but yeah, Frank Turek will be here. You don't, I can understand that. It did not go well the last time he and I were in the same room. Would say a Christian type. Yeah, uh, and he 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 published the book. Uh, yeah, don't, not enough faith to be an atheist. You know, and so right the the title of the book 
is what is it? Is it projection or is it strong? I guess it's projection, false equivalence. Which name your fallacy because it depends on a lot of them. It's a straw man, I think, because we don't have faith. Faith is a. He did this story. argument where he showed how all of these other stars are bigger than our sun, and he shows how you you, know, you get up to Betelgeuse, get up to two or three things beyond Betelgeuse to the point where you, when you do the comparison, you can't even see our sun anymore. It's so small compared to everything else. And then he turns to the audience and says, see, this is proof there's a God. <laughs> so somehow, Man. C falls between B and D. That's proof there's a God. This, <laughs> this is the kind of logic they have. Surprise. Wednesday follows Tuesday. Proof there's a God. <laughs> Randall, hold your question. Um, I've got two fan questions from that I asked previously. Mm -hmm. um, first one is, I didn't write their names, damn it. I'll, I'll give you credit in the uh, once I edit the video. This is for Matt. Your thoughts on universal basic income and uh, in light of increasing automation? Really? You know about UBI? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's about the point. You but think that's what we're to put it in the context of increasing automation, uh, I'm in favor of making sure that we have some sort of universal basic income. I think what they're getting at is, is increasing automation going to make it necessary? Um, no matter if you want to I think it's not. already necessary. I don't, I don't know that the automation fundamentally changes that, but then that's not my field. Yeah. I would just, as, as a humanist, the base thing is uh, we have people in poverty and in need, and it's not necessary that that be the case. Let's think about this for a moment. You know, a buddy of mine was working for Uber doing the, the self-driving car, so he's paid to not drive a car. Sweet. He, he just sits in the car and it drives. But he, he's not allowed to touch his cell phone. If you touch <coughs> your cell phone, you're fired. Right, so he has to sit there and he has to mind the road. He can't be looking away from the road. He has to be minding the road as if he's driving. And he's being monitored. There's, a call, there's cameras all around the car. And he's, but he's in an automated car and it is an Uber, so he's picking up passengers and, and not <coughs> driving them around. And there was this accident that was on his team, this friend of mine, his team, uh, where the car had plenty of time to see this woman and stop, but didn't, and hit her and killed her. Had that event not happened, the testing by now would have been complete and it would have been successful if that fatality had not occurred. This would have caused Uber to fire all of its Uber drivers and Lyft, fire all of theirs, and taxis around the world would all go away uh, and everybody would have either automated cars or they'd be, they'd be taking Uber or Lyft or whatever, and there'd be nobody in the car. So when you have to get a drunk ride home, you're the only one in the car, but you're, you're still, you can't be held, you know, driving drunk. As a matter of fact, if you have your own automated car, you can prove that the car was driving and not you, and you can still go home drunk. But what the, the result of this, and they've already had an automated truck deliver an order of Budweiser for whatever reason, because Budweiser wanted to be in, get their name in history somewhere, where an automated truck delivered this order of Budweiser. It's driving by itself. And now what happens if the taxis, Uber, Lyft, all of these driving companies, the, the, the trucking industry goes automated? That's the biggest industry we have. Yeah. If you automate that, it would be impossible to tell people to go get a job. There won't be jobs to get. And do we allow people to starve because unemployment is impossible? Do we give them limited uh, benefits for unemployment and then they're just out? We would have to. I, know, I don't identify as a socialist, but there's some point where you have this level of automation taking away this many jobs. You're either going to have to be a full-on socialist state or you're going to have to reduce the automation and, and nobody's going to do that because it's cheaper. So everything we do wrong is because it's cheaper and makes us a profit. That's a good point because 60% uh, of American jobs involve driving. And uh, Associated <coughs> Press just reported yesterday, as a matter of fact, that uh, they, uh, the court have, um, found Uber not liable for that, that, that woman's death. And I, I don't buy into the you know, the, the fears of automation. Yeah, it's going to kill jobs. It's always killed jobs. We Jobs die. The world changes. And there are other potential solutions, perhaps going down a full socialist type society route. I'm, I'm fine with notions like that. But the fact that we go for automation because it's cheaper, uh, I'm in favor of that too. It's a good thing. If we can, if we can make the process by which we do things more efficient, more cheap, more cheap for all of us, then at least that means that there's more potential 
pool money out there to solve the problems for the jobs that may go away. There's no easy solution, but I am not going to, you know, toss out progress and improvement uh, just because it costs a blacksmith a job or a truck driver a job. And I know that pisses people off because truck drivers are closer to my age and they're, you know, oh, am I, I'm not going to get a job in software or this other stuff. So yeah, there's real problems and no easy solutions, but I'm, I, I'm not remotely, that's what probably why I, I didn't really, wasn't that concerned with how automation affected it because we're going to find some way to fix it. <laughs> there, there are probably more immediate pressing problems that we should be fixing and we're not than worrying about what happens when we get self-driving cars. But Yeah, I, I didn't think we had four years to go run screaming in the wrong direction when it comes to climate change. Yeah. You know, to, to be reopening coal plants and everything. I was at Standing Rock I, and, I, and I when they're trying to, to, to set up the, the, the I can't, remember the name. I can't remember the name of the pipeline in the question, but yeah. they, they knew that every pipeline they lay out, every one of them leaks, right? And so uh, Obama finally, in, in light of this huge thing that they've tried to keep suppressed, they didn't want to have any new news agencies up there. I drove up there myself because nobody that I, the people that I was associated with had no idea that it was going on and didn't believe me because you've got to read special news to even find it. So I have to go up there to verify this is actually happening. We're really here. And by the way, CNN is not here. And look at all these other news agencies that are not here, right? There's like Democracy Now! is there. And they arrested her, uh, their, their lead uh, reporter, they arrested her and charged her with 45 years in prison, or tried to, tried to convict her for 45 years felony for reporting the news because they didn't want that news to get out. <laughs> but the news did get out, and it's because of superheroes, surprisingly. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, the guy who played uh, uh, Incredible Hulk, he showed up. And he brought a solar charging station. And then the next, the, the next week or so, the guys that played Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman show up <laughs> at Standing Rock. And this is the only publicity they can get. They had to have these superheroes show up to do something honestly heroic in order for news to get it. And then you don't, it, it's only popular news, because I said you know, the, the, the corporate news agencies weren't there. But they, they got enough attention that Obama finally backed down and the Army Corps of Engineers said, no, stop this pipeline, this is not going to work. And, and they, they shut it down for, for the reasons of logistics, that it will rupture, it will destroy these people's water supply, and that's it. Trump takes over, reverses everything, reinitializes the whole plane, kicks everybody out, tries to push legislation that makes it criminal to, to protest the construction of a, corp, of, of a commercial venture. So there goes your, your right to peaceful assembly. Right, one of the one of his many attacks on the First Amendment, and then they they establish that pipeline. What happens? It ruptured. And I don't remember what the numbers were. If I remember correctly, it was something like fifty thousand gallons of crude that go into the one river that these uh, that the Standing Rock Sioux has was their only water supply. It's not like anybody didn't know that was going to happen. I just got your shirt. It, is it, does anyone know the reference? Yes, Douglas Adams. Yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, Randall, did you have one? I do. Um, back to the topic of debates. Locally here we have the Bible and Beer Consortium that has hosted debates in the past. Uh, some of us are involved with that. And they, uh, you guys both have been a part of some of the debates they've had. Lately they have really steered away from the traditional atheist, theist debates. They have a debate last week which is a theist versus a theist talking about biblical justice which had to be hysterical. Um, but um, uh, the implication is that they can't find atheists willing to debate. Are you guys both willing to go on record that you're willing to debate? Well, I'd be happy to wait. Oh, you say the implication is? There, there's been messages on their website that they just can't get. Um, okay, because I'm in contact with Ezra on a regular basis. We're setting up Bible and Beer Consortium stuff in Austin. I've got Two debates upcoming with them. Now maybe they just can't have, find anybody other. They haven't publicized yet. So. Maybe they just can't find anybody other than the two of us. But Ezra will have me up to do a debate whenever he needs an atheist. So that's not the issue. I think. I think the. Or as far as I can tell, that's not the issue. What I suspect may more likely be the issue is finding theists that are willing to debate atheists, because that's the biggest problem we always face. I see. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that any of them are willing considering what ends up happening over and over again. But every, I get contacted all the time by secular organizations saying, hey, we'd like to have you down for a debate. 
And I'm like, great, find an opponent and a topic and then contact me because I'm not getting my hopes up. I'm not even penciling anything in on the calendar until you have an opponent because it's very difficult to find theists who are willing to step in and actually debate atheists that way, or at least finding anybody prominent. And they said they sent out a message sometime in the last year just asking if there was any atheist willing to debate. Yeah, because they're tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a guy named Inspiring Philosophy, I think is his name. Uh, one of those uh, the, the new age woo merchants on YouTube. I've never seen his stuff, so I, I don't really know, but that, that's what I think the guy is. And I got a number of messages from people who know him who say that he's been trying to contact me, trying to get a debate arranged by the BBC in Dallas, and he says the BBC keeps telling him that they're, they're going to set this up, and I have to tell him, no, it's not that I'm refusing you, it's that I've never heard from the BBC, they've never contacted me, and he keeps, he, his people keep contacting me again. I'm like, no, they know how to reach me. They got my email address. Nobody said anything to me. All right, thank you. So it is what's going on direction-wise. Now, a funny thing happened at the debate that I did two weeks ago in Waco. Uh, and the topic was, does the Christian God exist? And it was me and Braxton Hunter. The debate's online. It's actually on both of our pages. But, uh, so I went and I was basically using the argument for divine hiddenness and inconsistent revelation to point out that not only am I not convinced the Christian God exists, but I may in fact be convinced to some extent that it doesn't exist, but I certainly don't understand how they can do it, how, how they can think that they're justified. So the debate's completely over, and Leighton Flowers, who is the organizer of all this, gets up to thank everybody and give, oh, I don't know, an extra rebuttal. Mm. Now. He gets to do whatever he wants, and I wasn't going to complain. I'm certainly not going to cry foul. But when I listened to it, I definitely didn't want to say anything. Because essentially, he got up there and decided that he needed to point out that all those things I said about looking for evidence for God, that's just a mistake. You don't want God to move a pencil or do, you know find evidence. God speaks internally with this inner, still, quiet voice. So don't look for evidence out there. Just trust your gut. Now... I didn't need a comment beyond that because to anybody who watches the debate who's not already part of his team, he basically stood up and said, hey, Matt's right, <laughs> as, his as, as, a, as an extra rebuttal. The debate was over between me and Braxton. Leighton gets up and does this, you're not going to find evidence of God out there. You just need to trust your inner voice. <laughs> when I just got done explaining that that's how we end up with a thousand different denominations that all identify as Christian. So... If they're going to keep having those types of things at debate, it's no wonder they're having difficulty finding people to do it. And I've had a number of people offer to do debates, and, they, and they, I say, well, they, I give them the option to come up with their own question to, to be debated. And every time I give them the option, they come up with something stellar that, that, that shows me that, that I, I have opportunities to, to bash religion in this, that they've just opened up in the flaw of the question, they want to debate, this is, this will be great. And I know the only two ways they can defend, and they don't know the five that I'm gonna beat that down with. So I'm all excited about doing this, and then they back out. Anyone else? Well, I have one more fan question from yesterday. Um, it's for both of you. Are humans still subject to natural selection, or is it our, all artificial selection now and where do you think our what what do you think our descendants will look like in three million years? I have no idea if there'll be any descendants in three million years. <laughs> yeah. really, as long as there's nature, we're affected by natural selection. Now, the the core or basic philosophy of transhumanism is that we're supposed to take over, or then take take over natural selection and start doing it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, Q Gattaca, for example you know, where we start manipulating our own genes. And that's the sad thing, is because while I, I, I love evolutionary studies, I love studying the evolutionary history of this planet and everything, evolution is a cruel process. And the way that if you, if you bypass, if you find any reason to, to allow everybody to live, for example, so that people aren't being naturally selected away by, you know, by that, that harsh means, then you allow uh, variance and deviance to come in, and when I see devi deviations in the ge in the genome, right, and so all of these persist, and so he, we have to become transhumanist if we're going to be trans if we're going to be humanist at all, because evolution is a cruel process, and we can't let evolution rule because it is a cruel process. We have to be humane and allow these people to live, which of course defies. The evolutionary nature, which is why we have to take over our own selective process and not make it a selective process, make the corrections ourselves. 
It's kind of a weird tie, because for me, transhumanism and humanism have nothing to do with each other. No, that's correct. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are two different definitions. But transhumanism requires humanism being completely different concepts. Or humanism requir requires transhumanism. I would, as a humanist, I would disagree, because as far as I can tell, transhumanism is science fiction. Transhumanism is where we're manipulating our own genes. Yeah. For example, before people are uh, born, we, we, we realize that this person's going to have a propensity for this and that and the other, and we can use CRISPR now to correct that. You know, at some point, we, we will be doing this, or we're just going to, everybody is going to live, and we're not going to have a, a, a selective application at all. How about nanobots or some sort of chip that's implanted where it has a, where we can be connected online, maybe, or something? Anything like that? Somebody just advertised that they have that already a week ago. Somebody advertised that they can do that. I don't, I don't remember. Believe them. What's that? I don't believe them. I don't either. But it, it was it was some big name. Who the hell was it? It wasn't Elon Musk. But it was somebody along those lines that came up with it that, that said that they've now they they translated brain waves into words and they have a, a way to 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 link you into cybernetics essentially essentially. Battlefish. So, yeah, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't believe half the half the headlines I see anymore. It doesn't matter what the news source is. So is Matt saying he's a he's an a nanobotist? <laughs> so transhumanism, it's it's gone through changes, and there's a whole bunch of different aspects to it. And for years, what I would get from transhumanists is that we're approaching this notion, this singularity. abstract concept of the singularity, at which point our scientific technology will allow us to essentially live forever, and as a skeptic, my answer is, okay, that's science fiction until you actually demonstrate that's true. Is it a worthy goal to pursue? Sure. Uh, things that make us live longer, make us more efficient, that allow us to you know, better use resources, that where we can potentially manipulate things to kind of control our own destiny, I'm in favor of those things. I don't necessarily know that it's an absolute extension of humanism, but it may be that if it turns out this is the best thing forward, then of course it would fall under uh, humanist ideas. It's I, I'm fine. Let's let's pump money into research on human longevity, but let's not you know let's not derail funds that are going towards climate change issues and stuff that hey hey we hit the singularity exactly two years after we all died off. Yeah, yeah and I want to I want to want to put in a clarification because I, I'm talking about transhumanism. In, in terms of what was described in the movie Gattaca, there's so many people have used it as an example where we're, where we're manipulating or correcting our own genetic defects in unborn children, or, or not even children, in, in embryo, right? They're, they're manipulating the genetics in the embryo, and so you come up with somebody that doesn't have these defects or these propensities anymore. I have talked to other people who identify as transhumanists who think that we are going to have magic powers and immortality, that we will literally be gods. And these people are atheists, but clearly not skeptics. But I have run into a couple of them. Any other questions? All right. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, y'all debated a lot of apologists and theists and stuff like that over the years. And I've heard people call into the American experience. A lot of them are angry. Uh, I, I correlate anger sometimes with fear. Do you think they fear? If that's true, do you think they fear embarrassment, they fear losing their God, or they fear the control over other people? I can't imagine they're... they would be calling in to argue with Matt if they were afraid. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these people, are, are they, they feel righteous, they feel, they feel vindicated by their righteous belief, they're defending their faith, they're defending their belief position, and they, they sincerely believe that they have the edge, or they wouldn't be bothering to call him. Mm -hmm. Well, we get different types of callers too. There are people who are questioning and searching. They're not all calling in to argue. But when you when you hear things that sound like fear, they're probably fearful of one or more of all of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really difficult to have your your core identity and beliefs, you know, challenged and to do it on live TV. Um, so they're not. I, I don't ever see people who are fearful in the sense of. Well, I was going to say not in the sense of being cowardly, but those are the people that just argue dishonestly through the entire thing. When we when we tend to see a fear, yeah, I think there's, you know, oh, holy crap, could I be wrong, and what impact is this going to have on my life, and what, 
you know, what am I going to have to change about my beliefs? And how is there a cascade effect from that? If I stop believing in God, does that mean anything goes and all of a sudden rape and murder and everything else is allowed? Oh my gosh, it's all yeah, yeah. So that that type of fear, which is instilled by the religion, uh, it's it's preying on normal human fears. So some of that comes into it. But since we have callers that call in, you know, some of them are on their high horse and convinced that they're just going to plow right through us. Mm -hmm. I have evidence for the existence of God. You know, it's like changed lives. It's the most <laughs> most common thing on the call screener. The call screeners will talk to him and just say like, "Has evidence for God?" And and inevitably, when we ask them what this evidence is, none of it qualifies as evidence, or at least nothing beyond anecdotal testimonial. You know, I found my car keys after praying. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. I, I get, and, and this is this is really one of the things that really keeps me going. Is that I, I get every single week I get a handful of emails of people thanking me. Uh, they usually credit him with having changed their minds on the religious position, but then they say after they discover him, then they find my videos attached to that. And now they understand the scientific aspect of it, and now they can defend their belief. This, I, I got two. Two emails like that in the last seven days, crediting you first. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you sending in finders fees or anything? But the, the easiest conversion that I ever did was this woman sent me a message where she said, you know, I know that Jesus exists and He's filled my heart and He and He's waiting to to, to save you. Or there's some words to that effect. And I, I wrote back and said, I'm pretty confident there is no God of any kind, much less you know certainly not yours. And he, there, I have a number of reasons how I know that. And then she wrote back and said, Yeah, you're right. Did somebody else get her phone? I don't really or or trust her resolve. Yeah. I feel like she's going to go talk to her sister and she's going to say, that guy's wrong. And she'll be like, yeah, okay. you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> really? yeah, I don't get email like that. I, I get, well, today, today's email was uh, this guy who thinks he's a prophet from God who's claiming that the super volcano at Yellowstone is going to erupt on the 11th at like 7.34 in the morning. He sent me all the details. And I normally would blow it off, but since it's only a few days away, I just sent him a single one-line response that says, what if you're wrong? Because I want him to come back and say, oh, there's no way I'm wrong. Oh, there's no way you're wrong if you're getting this message from God. And we get to March 11th and that volcano doesn't erupt. Wouldn't that be disconfirmation of your God or the yeah, fact that you're getting no God. Yeah. Did, did he say For which year? year? Uh, yes, this year. Okay. It's okay. what? Could, because so that, uh, two days away. Isn't it 60,000 years overdue? Any, any way that called there? I think it's every 60,000 years, and so we are. Yeah. I think that's yeah. what it is. We're way overdue. Yeah, so I got into, I got into a podcast with this guy named Thick Shades, who is one of these evangelical people who doesn't know anything about his own book. And I, I asked him to come up with a testable prediction because you, you, you're very good at retrospectively, you know, refitting things that have happened to say that you know this passage in the Bible that doesn't sound anything like that somehow describes the thing that, you're, that just happened. Well, give me something before it happens. Let's make it a prediction. Tell me something the Bible points out before it happens, and then when it happens, we can say, okay, well, the Bible got that right. Or when it didn't happen, you can admit that it got it wrong. Yep. And at that time, uh, uh, BP had the huge oil spill in the Gulf. And so Thick Shades made as his testable prediction, based on biblical scripture, that we were going to use nuclear bombs to close that hole. Close the leak in the, in the oil pipe that, that BP had in, in the Gulf of okay. Mexico. So, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. <laughs> and so the next time I talked to uh, to Thick Shades, I'm like, so what happened to that uh, nuclear weapon that we were supposed to fix that with? But of course, they never make a concession. They can never be wrong. Well, that actually happened. We did, in fact, close it with a nuclear bomb, but the, the mainstream news will not confirm it and tell you about it. It's, it's like when Harold Camping said the world was going to end on May 21st, 2011. Or the five times he claimed before. It <laughs> well, it made this, it was such a big deal about it that people had like... One, one woman tried to murder all three of her children to save them from Satan on the eve of this event. Another guy spent all of his life savings in his 60s to, to put things on billboards to get people to believe. People sold their houses. Yeah, they sold everything. And so there's this wonderful photograph. I, I, I love it. I think it's great. This is a guy who's in Times Square when this was supposed to happen, 6 p.m., 
And then, and, and everybody's standing around him laughing as he's checking his watch because it's like 6 05. <laughs> Jesus, you are late. <laughs> so Harold Camping said the world was going to end, right? But then in the last few days before the world was supposed to end, somebody leaked his roster where he was still scheduling interviews and advertisements mm -hmm. for the following week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. And then when the world didn't end, he said, well, really, it did end. We just didn't notice it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the job is with us at 720. Is that not yeah. something I'm likely to notice? <laughs> <laughs> not you. You're a godless heathen. You wouldn't notice it. <laughs> 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 the the Seventh-day Adventists pulled the same thing. They said it, it, was yeah. a, it was an age, it was a change of age. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's slippery. Cool. They're slippery. Okay, guys, that is it. Um, thank you, gentlemen, both of you, for, for uh, allowing us to ask you some questions. I'll buy you a beer. Where are you going? All right.